Welcome back. This video is about formal proofs. You've already learned the easy rules, the conjunction intro and elim, disjunction intro and negation elim. Reit is also an easy rule. That just allows you to repeat any other line. The two hard rules are disjunction elim and, and negation intro. We're going to talk about disjunction elim now. This rule, the, how we do it in a formal proof is is with the disjunction elim rule. But when we reason this way in our everyday lives, it's called proof by cases. So proof by cases is like the informal name of the method. But really, these things are the exact same thing. They work exactly the same, whether you're doing it informally or formally. So it's really helpful. Sometimes I'll move back and forth between these names because they are perfectly interchangeable. Uh, in order to understand how this works, let's think about a problem that you've already solved before. Remember this argument about the bank robbers, A, B, C, or D, uh, and the self-driving car case. So I put in here, we're assuming this is a traditional car, so there's no, no uh, Teslas allowed. What that means is this really is a valid argument. D has to be guilty. And the way we can prove it is by using premise number two to structure our proof. Premise number two is a disjunction, and that's proof by cases is how you reason from a disjunction. Remember the elim rules. Elim means how do we use some information? How do we eliminate a sentence with a connective we already have? So you can only apply disjunction elim if you have a wide scope disjunction somewhere. That's how the rule works. And we can only do proof by cases if we know a disjunction. And premise number two is the disjunction that we know. So we said previously, this is how we're going to do the proof. We know A, B, C, or D has to be guilty. So we just take each one in turn. And we show no matter which one of those it is, because it's got to be one of them, D has to be guilty in every possible scenario. And that means D just has to be guilty, period. Proof by cases, all this method that we're going to learn is, is a way to codify or make systematic that thing that should already be familiar from the previous example, that that really is a valid way of, of reasoning. So in order to make it clear to our audience what we're doing, we're going to say, instead of just saying proof, we're going to say, we're going to do proof by cases. And then you repeat the disjunction that you know. So there has to be a disjunction that follows here. You can't do proof by cases unless you know a disjunction. Uh, and then what we say is we just put in some extra sort of uh, some scripting here. Like we say case one, and then what do you infer after, or what do you assume after case one? After you write case one, you assume the first disjunct, namely that A is guilty. And then what you do is you just go through each possibility. The number of cases that you have is determined precisely by the number of disjuncts in the disjunction that you know. So when you do proof by cases on a disjunction, that always tells you exactly how many cases you need. And so the structure of your proof really follows perfectly from uh, this in a systematic way, given the information that you have. So let's assume A is guilty. And then we need to, we need to end that subproof with the conclusion, because we need to prove D is guilty in that case. And this is how I walked through it. So you can just uh, pause your videos and read that. That was sort of the same reasoning that we talked about before. Now, I didn't complete this proof because it would just take too much space. But what do I do in case two? Case two, what, would I, what I would write right here is, let's assume that B is guilty temporarily. And if B is guilty, we can also show that our conclusion follows, namely uh, just from premise three. What about case three? What if, what if C is guilty? Then again, we use the reasoning that was embedded in here um, to show that D has to be guilty. What about case four? Well, case four is just D himself or herself. So we know D has to be guilty if D is guilty. This is sort of like the reiteration example. The conclusion just follows immediately in case four because that is the temporary assumption. So when you start each case, you're, you are making another assumption. This is sort of like a premise, but it's not a, a permanent premise. It's not one of the premises of the argument because we don't know A is guilty in the argument itself. All we know is that this disjunction is true. So this is what we call this as a temporary assumption. We can assume A is guilty only while we're in case one. Once we switch to case two and we're assuming B is guilty, we can no longer, we're no longer entitled to this information. So once a case ends, you have to put it aside. It's done with. And then you, when you start over with each other case, you only get a new temporary assumption. You can't go back and, and rely on those other temporary assumptions. Okay. Now, if you can prove it in every one of those cases, then you just need to finish off your proof by saying, you know, since it follows in every case, we know it follows for good, period. Uh, and that finishes proof by cases. Now, um, hopefully you've already read in the textbook how disjunction elim works. So what I want you to try to do is practice it. So pause your videos now and see if you can figure out this problem.
Okay, that was your chance to pause your videos. Um, we're going to talk about the answer. Uh, the first thing I noticed, remember my overall strategy. I always look at the main connective of my premise and my conclusion. That's the first thing I always do. And what I notice here is that it's a wide scope disjunction. And disjunction tells me I should use proof by cases. You do a disjunction even on a disjunction. So I need to sketch out my temporary cases. Now, this is the new thing that you haven't seen before. How do we make those cases, those temporary assumptions in the formal proof space? It's called a subproof. All I do, you see, temporary assumptions are a lot like the premises of a proof, but they only hold in this little mini sub subproof. So this thing that we're going to draw is like a little proof inside the big proof, and we just call it a subproof. And instead of calling it a premise, in order to keep clear when these are temporary assumptions and not the permanent premises, is I'm going to just write the word assume down here. A nice thing about the graphical interface, what the way this represents proofs is, if a vertical line is ever still going, you know that the assumptions or premises of that vertical line are in effect. So, so the, the, this thing is called the parent proof. The premises are always in effect throughout the entire proof. You can always go back and cite those things. The way that we can make this assu the assume here temporary is when we start this subproof, it's going to have an end. It's eventually got to end because this final conclusion is not in the subproof. We need to prove this final conclusion follows just from the premises alone. So that's why these subproofs actually don't continue for the entire proof, but they have to have a beginning and an ending. And we signal the beginning by the word assume instead of the word premise. Remember how we said these vertical and horizontal lines are actually inessential? The way that you do a subproof if you don't have those graphical devices is we're just going to use this vertical bar and, and a standard keypad or keyboard has this. So you just put that in there and you put one space in this in this vicinity here. And this is how we um, signal that not not p is actually in a subproof and it's not just in the parent proof. And again, you write the word assume in order to do that. All right, so let's go back and do it this, the, the typical way. Let's um, use this graphical device. What do I do after I infer not not p? My goal, remember, is I have to prove in that case that p or q follows. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my main connective of my new assumption. It's this double negation, so I can just get rid of those two things. That's negation elim on that rule. Now that I have p, I'm not done because I need my conclusion. So I'm going to introduce the disjunction there. Now, once I've got my conclusion in that case, I'm going to end this subproof. So that's why that's got to stop on the end line four. What do I do after that? You have to do proof by cases, disjunction elim. You have to do a separate subproof for every disjunct. That's all, those are my separate cases. So here's my subproof number two for my second case. And again, that starts with a new assume line. Um, so disjunction intro on line five is how I build my conclusion in that case. Notice I've got the same sentence on both of those. So this is great. I, I'm going to get my final conclusion here. How do I export it out of those subproofs to prove it out here? Um, remember what we're doing. Why did you start those subproofs in the first place? I started them because I have a disjunction. So disjunction elim is the rule that I'm citing my final disjunction from. And when you cite this rule, you always have to cite several things. First, you cite the disjunction you're eliminating. So that's line one, and then a comma. Then after that, you cite the subproofs. And when you use this dash line, you see I'm not citing the individual lines two and four. I do two dash four in order to signal that I'm citing the whole subproof. Because once the subproof ends, once the subproof ends, like down here or down here, you can no longer cite individual lines of the subproof. They become closed. They're like little black boxes after you're outside of the subproof. Once the subproof is over, you can only cite the whole subproof as a chunk or as a unit. That's what the dashed part means. And again, there are no spaces in this. It's just disjunction elim semicolon one comma two dash four comma five dash six. That's the um, mechanism for citing disjunction elim. And you cite as many subproofs. In this case, I only had to cite two as I need. And that's determined just by the number of disjuncts in your original disjunction. Okay, so that's how you do proof by cases and disjunction elim. All right, thank you.